Hello and welcome back to Algebra, the video course where we talk about groups, rings and fields. And indeed we are still in the topic of group theory and in today's part 13 we will talk about some special subgroups. More precisely we will talk about a relation we can have between subgroups and it's called conjugate subgroups. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. Only because of your support, I am able to make such math videos. And as a thank you, you find additional material with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start with the general picture, which explains that a group homomorphism transports subgroups. In fact, we have already discussed that in general with the last video and now we can apply it to some special group homomorphisms. Namely, we consider a group homomorphism phi which sends the group G to G again. Now such a homomorphism which just considers one group is usually called an endomorphism. Indeed, you can remember that in general, if we have the transformation from the object into itself, it's called an endomorphism. Moreover, in this video today, we will learn some additional notions for some special homomorphisms. However, first you should recall that the image of a subgroup under any group homomorphism is a subgroup again. So the image here we find on the right hand side, but you know it's in the same group G again. Hence, it's possible that we find a completely new subgroup of G by using our group homomorphism. Now, as I've already told you, here we will consider even more specific endomorphisms and they are called automorphisms. Also, this new name automorphism is not so complicated and I will explain it soon. First, I want to explain what we mean when we say inner automorphism. In fact, this is not so complicated, it's just a common group homomorphism phi between G and itself. And the action of phi can be described by using the group operation inside G. This means the image phi of X can be written as an element G times X times G inverse. And as always, in order to make it simple, we don't need a name for the group operation at all. This means obviously here in between we have the group operation in G. And that's it. If phi can be written in this special form by using an element in G, then we call it an inner automorphism. And at this point I can also tell you that automorphism is just a special name that is used for a particular endomorphism. More concretely, it's an endomorphism that is also an isomorphism. And the term isomorphism you might have heard before because it's simply a homomorphism in both directions. Indeed, this is important to remember. If someone says isomorphism, they mean a bijective map that is a homomorphism in both directions. And now only the last part in the name remains to explain. We say inner if this automorphism is represented by an element in G. So one could say it's represented by an inner element. Indeed, if you give me this element G, I can construct the whole homomorphism phi. And this is the reason why these automorphisms are so important, because we can use everything we know for the maps inside the group G itself. So for example, we already know that if we have a subgroup U in G, then we can form the pre-image and the image of U under phi. And now both things are definitely subgroups in G again. And now by using the definition of phi, we see that these subgroups are related to our original subgroup U by using the element G. And exactly this relation we can have for subgroups leads to the following definition. There we just consider any two subgroups U and V in G. And now we call them conjugate subgroups if they are associated to such an inner automorphism as before. Hence more concretely, we need the existence of an element G in the group capital G such that V can be written as G times U times G inverse. So again, we don't use any symbol to denote our group operation. 
However, we use this short notation here, which just stands for the whole set constructed with the operation from before. Indeed, such notations are used a lot to denote subsets in the group G. And usually the notation is self-explanatory, just substitute the set in the symbol by an element of it. And then just go through all possible instances, and then you get the whole new set out. And there you should also recognize that this is exactly the image of u under phi, if we define phi in that way. So regarding to an inner automorphism, the one subgroup is the image of the other. Obviously, you can also change the order by using the inverse of G. Hence, it's a symmetric relation and we can just say these are conjugate subgroups to each other. Moreover, it's not hard to show that besides the symmetric property, we also have a reflexive property and a transitive one. And with that, you can already see that the term conjugate subgroup defines a whole equivalence relation on the set of subgroups of G. Indeed, there I would say this is a good exercise. Please check the three properties of an equivalence relation for yourself. Okay, and now one important implication of that is if we consider the set of subgroups of G, where each subgroup is represented by a circle, then we find the partition of this set. More precisely, we can put these elements that are given by subgroups into disjoint equivalence classes. So if you take a subgroup U, it belongs exactly to one equivalence class. And you know, usually we use brackets to denote an equivalence class for a given element. And now in this case of conjugate subgroups, such an equivalence class is really easy to describe. Namely, each conjugate subgroup can be described by such an element G, so we just go through all elements in the group. And that's it, you just take an arbitrary element G and you multiply it from the left hand side and the inverse from the right hand side. And with that, we get all the subgroups in the equivalence class. However, as you can see in the picture, we could definitely have more than just one equivalence class for a group G. In fact, we immediately see that the whole thing is trivial if we consider an abelian group G. There, the commutativity simply destroys this construction here. By using the set notation, it's simply to see we can just exchange the order here in the middle and then we have G times G inverse, which is the identity element. Hence, the only thing we get out here is U itself again. Therefore, for an abelian group, this equivalence class here only has one element, namely U. In other words, the nice term of conjugate subgroups does not help at all for abelian groups. Therefore, if we want to discuss an example, we should take one which is not commutative. This means the order should be not too small, and we already know one example, namely the symmetric group S3. So please recall part 7, where we have discussed the whole thing, and where we have also explained that we can see it as a permutation group on three elements. On the other hand, equivalently, we can also describe S3 with this rotation and the reflection operation. In this case, the six elements of our group can be written down, first the identity, then A, then B, then A squared, A times B, and B times A. And there I say it again, the group is not commutative, so AB is not equal to BA. And now it's really easy to show that E together with B form a subgroup. There you just have to know that doing the reflection twice, so B squared, is equal to the identity again. And with that we are ready to consider the conjugate subgroups of U. So for example, our element G could be given by A. So we have A, U, A inverse, and we already know U only consists of two elements. Of course, the identity stays the identity, but our second element can do something. So we have A, B, A inverse, and there you should know that A inverse is equal to A squared. And now we can visualize this element with the picture above, and let's say we read it from left to right. Hence, first we apply the rotation A, and then the reflection B. So this is what we get, 
and then we have to use the rotation A twice. So this is not so complicated and the result you can see here. And now you can compare that with our discussion from part 7 and then you see that this is actually just the element BA. So we can simply shorten that to BA. Therefore our conjugate subgroup here is also a subgroup with two elements. But definitely not the same as U. Okay, but now we can also look at another conjugate subgroup. So instead of G, now let's use our element A squared. So obviously this looks really similar to before, but now we have to multiply with A squared on both sides. Or more precisely, on the right hand side, instead of the inverse of A squared, we can just use our A. You already know that, 3 times this rotation is the identity again. And there you can do a similar picture as before and you see that this construction a squared b a is actually just a b. So again we get another subgroup and now it's e a b. Okay and now you see we have two elements left and for these we can also write down the conjugate subgroup. So first let's use our element a b. This means in our set we find a b times b and then AB inverse. However, now it's not hard to check that AB is self inverse, so the inverse of AB is AB again. And moreover, you should see in the middle we have B squared, which is equal to the identity. So what we actually have is just A squared times B. And similarly to before, we can do the calculation and we find out that this is actually BA. Alternatively, you can also conclude that from the equations we already have here. But most importantly, the result is that we get the same group as before. So by using the notation from before, different g's could lead to the same conjugate subgroup in the end. And then finally, let's take our element b a. And maybe there you can already guess the result. Indeed everything is very similar to before because also here we can use that the element BA is self inverse. Moreover, also not hard to see, we have B squared in the middle again. So what remains is simply BA squared. And there please check that this is equal to AB. So also there we don't get a new subgroup out. And now in order to make the list complete we should also put in E and B. However, there you should just see that in both cases we just get out our original group U. And now you can count, we have exactly three conjugate subgroups to U. This means the equivalence class of U consists of three elements. Moreover, you can also recognize that all these subgroups are more or less similar because they only consist of the identity element and the self inverse element. And exactly such a relation for conjugate subgroups we want to put in a general context. However, I would say this is something we can do with the next videos. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Go.